I stand just inside of those gates of pearl, and the master's face I see. I'll gladly meet at his nail-star feet. Oh, praise the Lord. Yes, he did. Yes. Welcome to part 39 of our study, going through the life of our wonderful Jesus. And I'm so happy we can study now because we're going to study something very important that Jesus did and talked about. We're seeing wonderful parallels in his life between what happened in his day and what happened in our day about 2,000 years later. And uh, it's very encouraging what God does for us and what he'll do for you. It says, what he's done for others, he will do for you. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Uh, so, Matthew 13, I'm starting with verse 1. It says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Can you picture the Son of God sitting in a boat just a little off the shore and a whole, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people were on the shore listening to him, standing or sitting, listening to the Son of God dressed in plain clothes, sitting in the front of a boat. Uh, if you knew that the Son of God was sitting in front of a boat out on uh, the water, and you saw a whole big crowd of people there all along the shore, uh, and you saw the crowd, and you saw the boat, and you saw the Son of God there in the distance, what would you do? What would you do? Would you get closer and closer? You would? And you would get as close to that boat as you could? I know I would too. Um, when Jesus went back to heaven, the angels told the disciples, this what? 
this same Jesus, the exact same one that held the little children on his lap and they went to sleep, leaning their head on his breast. The same tender Jesus is the same Jesus that's going to come in the sky very soon. Isn't that wonderful? Now, why, why weren't those children afraid to come up into the lap of Jesus, the Son of God, and, and sit on his lap and lay their head on his chest? Didn't they know who he was? Wouldn't they be scared to death? Uh, the, the same Jesus that came down on the mountain in flame and fire and thunder, uh, and the people quaked, and Moses quaked, and uh, they were, uh, I mean, they were scared to death. Uh, why weren't the little children scared to death? Well, maybe that's a question that we can't totally answer right now. But I just pray that when the lovely Jesus comes, this same Jesus, that the children sat on his lap, the same Jesus, I pray that you and I, that you and I and all of us will be like those little children and say, look, this is our God. We've waited for him. He will save us. I pray that we'll be happy when Jesus comes. Don't you? I really do pray that um, we studied some time ago, behold the goodness and the severity of God. To some, he seems severe, but to some, he seems so kind because he really is kind. Who is it that he seems severe to? Is, is it not those who are disobedient and wicked and unbelieving? Yes. But those like the little children that are not resisting the Spirit of God, they're not afraid to come and sit in his lap. And so he, here he is in this boat. Do you think the angels were gathered around watching? Yes, they were. Verse 3, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. A sower went forth to sow. Uh, what would we call a sower today in our day? Farmer. A farmer went forth to farm. A farmer went forth to plant seeds. A farmer went forth in his tractor, or maybe by hand, to plant seeds. In this context, it was by hand because he threw the seeds. And verse 4, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up uh, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were what? Scorched. Uh, and because they had no root, they withered where? Away. Away. And some fell among what, Brother Doug? Thorns. And the thorns sprung up and what? Choked them. Now, if you're choked, that means you're strangled and you can't get what you need from the outside in to, to nourish you. They were, um, they were choked. They were, something was choking them. Verse 8, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And then what does Jesus say in verse 9? Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, let's look real closely at what we just read. Uh, first, let's go back and let's look at the scene of Jesus sitting in his boat a little off the shore in the water. Do you think his boat was going up and down at all? Yes. Uh, did, could you hear any lapping of any waves? I think so. Because in a great body of water, uh, there's nearly always some waves, even if they're that tall, you can steer, still hear them lapping. And uh, the people are standing there, children, older people. I don't know how far and wide the line of people were or how deep, I, we don't know. But there were a lot of people there. And, uh, and so... Uh, do you think the sick were there? Yes, the sick were there, uh, lying on their mats, waiting to present their cases before Jesus. If you want to find out more about this and look it up for yourself, look in Christ's Object Lessons, page 33 and 34, and you'll find and get the whole story. Read about it. Yes, there were sick there. Um, 
uh, just waiting to present their cases to him. Now, here's a question. Did Jesus have the right to heal them? Yes, he did. Are you sure? Yes, he had the absolute right to heal them because he had made them, and he had the right to heal them. Friend, when you're sick, or your little boy, your little girl is sick, does Jesus have the right to heal you? Does he have the right to heal your child burning up with a fever? What do you say? Yes, he has the right to do it. And if Jesus has the right to heal you and to heal your loved ones, do you have the right to ask him to do it? If it's his will. We always say, not my will, but thine be done. Yes, friend, you've got the right to ask. Does God say ask? Yes, he says ask, and it shall be given you. Sweet Vanita and I just flew yesterday with a dear mother and a little four-year-old boy to a hospital. We took off yesterday morning, and we just got back about an hour or so ago. And um, the little boy was burning up with a fever. They said his fever was 106. Now, that's very high, isn't it? I'm thankful it's not 106 the last I heard. But that little boy was so sick that if, if somebody didn't do something, he may die. Well, we knelt by his bed. We knew that King Jesus, who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, had the right to heal. Did we have the right to kneel down by his bed and ask that if it's his will, that he will heal him? Yes, friend, you have the right to do it. Did those little children have the right to come and sit on the lap of Jesus and lay their head on his breast? Did they have the right to do that? Yes, they did, friend. Don't let the devil tell you that you have no right to pray, no right to claim the promise of God, friend. You've got the right to do it because Jesus has the right to save you and you have the right to be saved. Isn't that right? If Jesus has the right to save you, don't you have the right to be saved? Yes, you do. Praise God, friend. You've got the right to be saved. If the devil's accusing and condemning you right now and saying, oh, you, look what you've done, you might as well give up. You can right now say, get thee, and Satan, in Jesus' name, for it is written, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And he will go, friend, and you can have perfect peace in your heart right now. Isn't that wonderful? Put your whole faith, your whole soul your whole will on God's side, and it's done. Uh, this is the wonderful Jesus It was in this boat. And so he had the right to heal these people. Now, a crowd uh, had gathered around there. Uh, not only that, beside the sea was the beach, and uh, um, beyond the beach was a great big plain. It was called the Plain of Gennesaret. On this plain uh, were hillsides, and as Jesus was sitting in that boat, wh who do you think was on the hillside that very moment? Farmers, sowers, they were there that very moment. And guess what they were doing? They were throwing their seed. As Jesus was in the boat, these sowers were sowing their seed that very moment. Do you believe that? Yes. And Jesus used that for an illustration to s tell the most wonderful uh, truth. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus then tell this parable? Why did he, didn't he just come out and say, I'm the Messiah. If you'll follow me and obey me and trust me, I will save you and I'll take you from heaven to heaven from this place. Why didn't he talk plain like that instead of using a parable? Do what? Okay. Um, yes, that's, that's true. Here's, I'll give you a hint. Before Jesus told this parable, did he come right out plainly and reveal to the religious leaders and the people that he was the Son of God in different ways? Did he do it more directly before he told this parable? You're right, the answer is yes. He had done it, and they had rejected him and hardened their hearts. They'd already rejected John the Baptist. Their leaders did. 
What does that remind you of? Has anybody rejected John the Baptist today? Can you think of any prophet today in modern times that reminds you of John the Baptist? Who can you think of? That's right. He said Ellen White, the modern prophet of God. Does any people today, even religious leaders, reject John the Baptist today in that form, if you will, like they did back in Christ's day? When they rejected John the Baptist, did that unfit them from, for the coming of Christ the first time? And when people reject John the Baptist today, will that unfit them for the coming of Christ the second time? The answer is yes. So you can see why God's prophet says to undermine faith in the spirit of prophecy is the devil's last attack upon God's church. Friend, you can see we're down in the last days right now, aren't we? We really are because it's happening everywhere. But it's very encouraging also because we are in the last days and Jesus is coming soon. He's coming very soon. Very, very soon. Do you think, how long do you think it's going to take before the Vatican actually consents to have a formal tithe with Israel? Will that take four, three years? How do you know it won't take a long time, Brother Ken? You heard it today on the TV or radio? On the news from last night. Isn't that interesting? Did they say that it happened suddenly? They said unexpectedly. Interesting. They're wanting that very suddenly. Well, does the Vatican want to make a headquarters in Jerusalem so when the devil appears as Christ, the Bishop of Rome can be his chief apostle? Well, uh, we know from um, the ex-Jesuit priest that the Vatican has wanted for a long time to make Jerusalem a center uh, because they, it was said that they found uh, Peter's remains in Jerusalem and not in Rome under the pontiff's throne, and that was very embarrassing to the Vatican. But all these things are just telling us, just little things. I mean, m hundreds and hundreds of things together tell us Jesus is coming soon. Also, the gospel is going to the whole world very quickly. Uh, it's just about already covered the entire world already right now. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, and so Jesus had openly spoke to the re uh, people and their leaders, and they'd rejected him. So now he speaks to them in parables. Um, God spoke to, has spoken to us openly, plainly already. Will God now speak to us in parables? Well, Jesus starts his parable. You see, the... Um, Religious leaders of Christ's day, what were they looking for in a Messiah? To the Roman That's right. You see, um, the Son of God had come, and when he had come, what did they ask for? A sign. They said, show us a sign. Give us a sign. They want to work us a miracle. Isn't that the way people are? They didn't want a spiritual kingdom. They wanted Disneyland. But Jesus didn't come to give Disneyland. Jesus came to make us like God. And so he had to speak in parables. He had already gone around saying, Repent ye, for the, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But when he said, Repent, how did they answer that? Show us a miracle. That's how they answered. And so now he speaks in parables. So he, and you know, their question was, what kind of kingdom are you going to bring? This is his answer. Quote, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Isn't that interesting? Christ had not come as a king, but as a sower. Did Jesus come here as a farmer rather than a king? Yes, he did. Was that shocking and unbelievable to the Adventists of his day? Yes. They didn't want a farmer. They wanted a king. Interesting. When Jesus said, He that soweth the good seeds is the Son of Man, do you think the conference men understood what he meant by that? Here it says, The Pharisees perceived the meaning of Christ's parable, but to them its lesson was unwelcome. 
they knew what he meant. They could see it was spiritual, but they didn't, they didn't like it. Uh, so it tells us we need to study the Word of God, amen? Please study the Word of God. People are dying all around. Brother Ken brought up just a few minutes ago. People are dying all over the place. Just recently, we saw somebody die, didn't we? Yes, we saw them. I watched them die. I've watched people die many places in hospitals and different other places. People are dying all over the place. You've probably seen people dying or dead in the newspaper, magazines, all over the place, slaughtered, hundreds of thousands of them in Rwanda and all over, uh, you know, uh, uh, Europe, Asia, all over the world. Uh, people are dying by the millions. We need to study the Bible because soon you may be dead. Soon a loved one of yours may be dead. And when you die, your eternal destiny is fixed forever, for heaven or hell. That's it. it your probation is closed at that moment. Uh, many are not going to live through the time of trouble to go through, uh, you know, the, the time ahead and, and have probation closed. On. They're not going to live for that. Millions are dying ahead of time. We need to study the Word of God. Friend, you need to be ready every day to meet Jesus, every day. And remember how much he loves you. He will help you. Don't be afraid of death. Those who know Jesus are not afraid of death. Amen? Because it says he came to set us free from that. And so Jesus tells this parable. Now let's look quickly at this parable. Uh, the sower goes forth to sow. It says the sower went forth. Where did he go forth out of? He went forth out of a walled what? Town. Now, in, 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 in Christ's day, most people lived in walled towns. Why? Safety. Safety. Yes, that's right. Jesus, just like the sower, went out of a walled town to sow. The sower went out of the walled towns because in the walled towns it was, uh, you know, safe in there. But the sower went out where it was dangerous, where robbers might get him. He went out there to sow. He says he went forth. Did Jesus go forth out of the walled town to sow? What was the walled town that he went out of? It was heaven, the safety of heaven. He went down to this earth where he was hungry and thirsty and spit on and beaten and murdered. Jesus went forth to sow. Uh, isn't that interesting? He went forth to sow for you, friend, because Jesus loves you. Do you know that what we're studying right now has something to do with you? Do you realize that the seeds that Jesus sowed stuck in your mind to help save you in heaven forever? It has something to do with all of us. He went forth to sow. Uh, what about in the Bible? Did Abraham go forth to sow? Was he a missionary that God sent forth and he got more souls? Yes, it says... Uh, Genesis 12, 1, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. How about Paul? Did he go forth to sow? Yes. Here in Acts 22, 21, it, Jesus said to him, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Have you, friend, gone forth to sow? Or are you still in the walled town? Are you still in the salt shaker? You might say, what do you mean? What are you doing with your life? Are you trying to save people or only thinking of saving yourself? Oh, friend, God wants you to go forth to sow, to sow the Word of God. You might say, hell, I don't know. I'm not a missionary. I'm not a preacher. I don't care. If you love Jesus, you'll pray, oh, Lord, please use me to help save somebody. I don't know what to do, Lord. I've prayed that prayer. I've prayed that prayer. One time when I was in college, I just got there. It was the first day of college. I went out in the woods. I prayed for an hour or an hour and a half on my knees in the woods. Lord, please, please use me for somebody in this college. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Please use me, Lord. Oh, friend, if you'll only pray that way, God will send you forth to sow, and that prayer will be answered. I went back in that college. I went in the library. I sat down, and soon a young man sat down beside me. We started to talk. We went out. We had Bible studies. I found myself upstairs in, in somebody's house with a whole group of people. God answered that prayer. Friend, if you'll only pray, 
Lord, please use me to so you might save somebody. God will hear that prayer. The problem is most people don't pray that prayer. Why not? Because they don't care. Isn't that right? Most people, most church members don't care about souls. They, they don't care because they don't know Jesus. Friend, when you know Jesus, you will care about souls. God will send you out. You'll, you'll pray, oh God, use me to save somebody. Even though you don't know anything, God will do it because His Holy Spirit can teach you. If you'll only pray because He'll give you love, a love for souls. So the sower went out. He went forth. Just like you're going to go forth. Paul, all of God's people have gone forth to sow. Now, some of the seeds, by the way, what did he sow? He sowed seeds. And what does a seed represent? That's right. The seed is the Word of God. When you receive a seed, or when you receive a promise in the Word of God, you have a seed. What is inside an apple seed? An apple tree, that's right. If I give you an apple seed, I've given you an apple tree because the apple tree is actually inside of the seed. They've seen it in there. You put that in the ground and water and so forth, and you've got the tree even before you see it because you've got the seed. Is the tree in the seed? Is the When you claim a promise of God, is the gift already in the promise before you ever see it? The answer is yes. So when you ask, when you believe God's promise and you claim it, and you thank God for it, I claim your promise, Lord, for forgiveness of sin. The devil's telling me my sins aren't forgiven, can't be forgiven. Lord, I rebuke him, I claim your promise. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I ask, I believe, Lord, you've forgiven me. Thank you, Lord, for you've forgiven me. Not because I feel it, but because you've promised. You've got the promise of God. Now, you know their conditions, but the conditions also in the promise. The condition is if we confess it, put it away. By the, and that's a gift of God, too. Repentance is a gift. But thank God. Claim the promises of God. How many promises of God are there in the Bible? There's over five. No, there's over 3,000. Uh, Elder Luffer was an old Adventist minister. He read the Old Testament 69 times. He read the New Testament 70 times. He counted in there 3,573 promises or clusters of promises. Now, that's more problems than you'll ever have. Isn't that right? There's more promises in the Bible than you've got problems or ever will have problems. Take the Bible, open it up, claim the promise of God, and you've got it. When you claim it, you've got it because the gift is in the promise. That's thrilling, isn't it? That's yeah. thrilling. And so Jesus sowed what? The Word of God. You receive that Word and you've got eternal life forever. Isn't that wonderful? That's a thrilling thought. Now, he sowed the Word. Now, after he sowed, when he sowed the Word, he gives an illustration. You see, Jesus had told them, I'm... I'm the Messiah in, in, in different ways, he's, he told them. They could have known, and some did accept it, but most rejected it. So he's trying to tell them the same thing now in different ways, by parables. The Word of God. And so now he starts talking about different kinds of people and how they will react to the Word of God. So he says, some seed fell by the wayside. Uh, and what happened to that? Did it just sit there on the path? Did it grow on the path? No? Well, what happened to it? That's right. The birds came by and ate it. Now, what does that bird represent? Can anybody guess? I'll count to three. If you can't tell me, I'll tell you. One, two, that's right. It represents the devil that comes by and picks the Word of God out of somebody's what? Mind. Uh, the path represents a per person or people that are just, you know, uh, unconcerned, inattentive hearers. They hear it, 
but they don't pay any attention to it. The devil just takes it right away and doesn't do them a bit of good. It's like they heard the news last month and they forgot all about it. It doesn't help them one bit. Hebrews 3.13 tells about people who are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Oh, friend, please, don't become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Their spiritual faculties are paralyzed. They don't discern. When they hear the Word of God, they don't discern that it applies to them. Like, for instance, suppose somebody's back there on the back pew telling jokes and laughing in the church. And I talk about here uh, that we must be reverent in the house of God and we must not sit way back on the back pew telling jokes and laughing. Well, if somebody is a, a path hearer, they will hear my words, and what will they think? They'll think, well, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. And they'll look around to see who's telling jokes and laughing. Isn't that right? They think, oh, that's not my, that must be for Brother Jones over there. That's, an, that's a, a path hearer. The devil just gets it right out. Plus, the devil has many helpers. Can you think of any helpers the devil has? To help people to be the, the seed of the word taken out of their mind? Listen, Christ's Object Lesson, page 45 and 46. It says, many who listen to the preaching of the word of God make it a subject of criticism at what? At home. At home. They get home and they criticize it. They sit in judgment on whoever is talking. Uh, they uh, cr uh, are use trifling, sarcastic comments. They m comment on the character of the person, their motives, their actions. Uh, the conduct of fellow members in the church are freely discussed. Uh, severe judgment is pronounced. Gossip, slander is repeated. This in the hearing of the unconverted and of the children. And so the devil says, Aha, you're doing a wonderful job, Mr. Parent. I'll turn your child into an atheist. You think the devil will use that to do it? The answer is yes. And so it says that many parents wonder why. Why aren't my children, why are they so sarcastic and have no interest in God? Why are they acting like this, like the devil? They don't realize they're copying you. Oh, friend, may we fall on our face and say, Oh, God, please. Help me to represent you at home. Bridle my tongue, dear Father. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me that I might be like Jesus at home. Oh, friend, if you're not a Christian in your home, then you're not a Christian. We need to be like Jesus in our home. Isn't that right? You need to be at home and in public and in private and at beside the water and on the grass and in the yard and in the living room the same all the time just like Jesus was the same all the time yes he had different emotions different things but he was the same Jesus if you're abiding in Jesus you won't be way up and then way down depressed and gloomy or uh, gossiping you'll be like Christ he was like the sun that went over the mountains it didn't affect him well, the, the people in the path, that's what the seed, it doesn't have a chance to grow. Then, before we close, let's talk quickly about those, the seed that falls in stony places. The seed is still the Word of God. Uh, the seed in stony places are people, now keep in mind, the seed represents the Word of God, but what does a different kind of ground represent? That's right, different kinds of people. So the stony ground, what kind of people is that? That's the people that hear the Word of God, and they what? They accept it? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they accept it, all right. Bang, they accept it fast. You take a seed and you throw it in the stony ground, and, that, and, and it rains, and that, stony, that seed will come up real fast. Um, but the problem is there's not too many places for the root to go except around the rocks and just a little dirt here and there. And it grows up real fast, just like a person in a, a stony ground hearer. He hears it, and he accepts it. Bang, just like that. And he gets all excited. I know I've seen people like that, and I pray that they don't stay like that. I pray that they'll be truly converted. But I know of one particular person 
Her, her name was Methuselah. She was a girl about six foot one, lived in my hometown, Richmond, Virginia, and um, I found myself studying with a whole group of young people, including Methuselah. And Methuselah just got so excited. I told, I mean, I was talking to the whole group, but when we talked about Jesus coming, Jesus dying on the cross and being raised from the dead and going back to heaven, and then the whole city of God coming down from heaven to this earth. And first of all, God's people coming up right out of the ground and us being changed, caught up to meet the Lord in the air and going up to heaven and what it was like in there and the new earth and heaven. And I mean, it was just overwhelming. And Methuselah got so excited that she actually jumped up and down. She was jumping up and down. She said, this is wonderful. She had been a true hippie, a true flower child in the 1960s. She said, I'm into this more that I've been into anything, LSD or flowers or anything else. She was so happy, jumping up and down. Happy, happy, until, until what? When the plant grows up real fast, it's got a little dirt, but not much. Then when the sun beats on it, what happens? When the sun beats on the plant in the good ground, what happens? What does the plant do? It sucks up more water and nutrients in proportion to the sun beating on it. The more the sun beats on it, the more it's sucking up water and nutrients, and the faster it grows. The more persecution you have, if you're rooted in the Word of God, the faster you grow spiritually. Do you believe that? Yes. In the good ground, the more heat on you, the faster you will grow into the image of Jesus Christ. But in the stony ground, the more when the sun beats, the persecution is what it represents. The plant tries, but it can't because there's no dirt there and it's scorched and withers and it dies away. And that's what happened to this dear young lady. It reminded me so much of this, and I still pray for these dear people, that person and all people. We can't judge them because it's not over yet. I pray that she will become good ground. But many are offended. Many are offended. You see, a, a, a person that has, it's in the, the stony ground, they're all excited and they accept Christ, but what are they depending on? They're depending on their self. They're depending on their emotion. They're depending on their feeling. They're depending on their experience that they've gotten. They're not spending much time doing what? Yeah. Studying the Word of God. They're not doing it. They think, I'm, I'm too busy. I know God. I love God. He, I'm, he's with me. He's right here. And look at the experience I have. I don't have time to study. I want to work for God. I want to do this and that. Oh, friend, is it dangerous even to work for God for souls if you neglect prayer and Bible study? Yes, you will fall away. They don't spend time in prayer and Bible study. They're not rooted in the Word of God. And so when the heat comes, they're all their flowery experience melts away, and they're offended. There was a young man like this in San Bernardino, California, where I was at Loma Linda University, he was working in the neighborhood, helping many, many people there. I was working with him and a, a whole team there. And I noticed he didn't take time in the morning to pray and study the Word of God, or in the evening either. He worked right up into the night until he went to bed. And a danger signal came to me for, to that poor man. I said, Brother, I said, you're not spending time in prayer and Bible study. You think you can work for God and go on like this and have the power of God with no time alone with God in Bible study and prayer? He said, I don't have time. He said, I've got to help these people. I warned him as best I could. I warned him as best I could. But I pray, I shuddered, I trembled for him because I knew the time was coming soon. If he went on like this, the devil was going to hit him and he'd, not, he'd fall right down because he didn't, he, you can't know God without spending time with him, you see. And so sure enough, Time went by, and something terrible happened. I don't even know if I dare tell you what it was. 
but I'll, I think I will tell you what it was. This young man was a white young man, and in that black neighborhood, a black young lady had a baby, white and black, mixed. I warned him. I said, please, spend time with God. Jesus said, some fell in the stony places, and when the sun was up, it was scorched and was withered. Oh, friend, please, cling to Christ and not yourself. Amen? Your hope is not in yourself. Your hope is in the lovely Jesus. One more class is the class that fell among thorns, and it says it was choked by the thorns. That's like the person people also. They they're, uh, they're endure longer than those in the stony places, but they also don't have time for God in prayer and Bible study. And they don't also weed out the weeds. The weeds come up when they're real tiny. It's easiest to get them out. But the bigger they grow, the harder it is to get them out. We have a garden. We know that, don't we? We learn wonderful lessons. Well, these weeds, if you don't study the Word of God and pray and don't overcome sin, like people today are trying to say, well, you don't have to worry about sin. You can't overcome it anyway. You've got a carnal nature. Jesus died on the cross. It's all paid to the cross. We're all saved anyway. Why worry about it? Is that, in essence, what these, these demon-possessed preachers, some of them are preaching? Yes, it is, excusing sin. Or teachers or whoever they are at, at the seminary or at the colleges or in the churches. That's the bottom line of it. Be saved in sin. And that's what they're saying, but in fancy words, of course to trick people into thinking that God loves you so much, uh, you won't be thrown into hell for that tiny little thing. We'll all be saved in a big group, and we'll all go to heaven together. Oh, friend, those who fell among the thorns were choked. It says the cares of the world and, and other things choked it. Jesus said, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Keep that in mind. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Thank God. He says... I can do all things through Christ. The pleasures of life choke many. The lust of other things. Uh, deceitfulness of riches. You trying to make money? Friend, if you live for money, you'll die with your money. Now as time is so short, you're not even going to have money soon. You won't be able to buy or sell. You cling to your possessions. You'll be like Lot's wife. Oh, friend, please, before it's too late, cling to Christ. Amen. Cling to Christ. Make a total surrender. Don't lose your eternal life now that we're on the borders of eternity. Please, it choose eternal things, choose Christ above all things, and all these things will be added to you. A young lady that I know was like this, that I went to college with. She'd been in the church for years, in the church, but she didn't know Jesus, but nobody knew it because she was the strictest of all the people, kids in the class. She was the strictest, believe me. I mean, she was strict. Why was she strict? We can't judge motive, but God tells us many people who don't know God are the strictest because they're filled with condemnation and guilt and they cannot get rid of their guilt. They have not a total surrender to God, so their guilt is pressing upon them. So they're so strict trying to get rid of their guilt. They're strict on others and they're strict on themselves. And everybody thinks they're wonderful Christians, but inside they're miserable and they're empty and they're guilty. And it's a do-it-yourself program. And everybody thinks there's a wonderful Christian, but... One day, the time comes where they snap. They can't take it anymore because it's do-it-yourself. They don't know God. They don't have the sweet, sweet love relationship. And so, all of a sudden, this strict young lady, who was so strict in every way and strict on others and would condemn others quickly if they made a mistake. Now she's in a bar prostitute, beer, cigarettes, bang, just like that. But was it just like that? The answer is no, it was not just like that. She'd been going this way for years, and now she was only doing what she only held herself off from doing because she didn't want to go to hell, but she didn't have heaven in her heart. So people thought, oh, they were flabbergasted. How could it possibly be the most strict, the most godly? It was not the most godly.
Don't have a do-it-yourself program. Don't try to work for God without knowing Jesus. Don't try to make just like make money and live for self and what everybody's living for. Get to know the lovely Jesus for yourself. You'll have the peace and joy in your heart. You'll be having heaven in your life now. And God will send you forth to sow the Word of God, and He will use you to help many, many to come to the lovely Jesus, to know Him as you know Him. The peace and joy in your life and in your face, they'll tell that you have something. You have something. And so until we're with you next time, remember, it's true. The lovely Jesus loves you. I stand just inside of those gates of good, and the master's face I see. I'll gladly meet at his name. Yes, he did. Yes.